Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome, thank you very much for coming to listen to my talk. Uh, my name is Rich, I am, a senior, I am a senior director of engineering for a company called Intercom. Now Intercom, for anybody who doesn't know it, we are an Irish startup, we're about seven years old. Our mission is to make business personal, and the way that the the way that we do that is we provide a customer communications platform which allows our customers to talk and interact with their customers. <coughs> Excuse me. And as I said, we're about seven years old and we seem to be doing this reasonably well and reasonably successfully so far. Today we have over 20,000 paying customers talking to about one billion monthly, uh, monthly active end users. And what I actually want to talk to you about today is one of the things which we think is becoming an, an increasingly more important element of our success strategy, and that is a software development framework and philosophy that, that we call Run Less Software. Now, Run Less Software, for me, it's actually more than a software development philosophy. It is actually a metaphor for how I see the business and technology world evolving today. And I have this kind of little lonely man here carrying a candle because I think the world is kind of a scary, dark, dangerous, difficult to win in uh, place. But, but I also think trying to actually go on this journey is a little bit of kind of a fun and exciting game. And I think some of you might actually be forgiven for thinking uh, that all sounds incredibly melodramatic. Maybe you are just a crazy person. And uh, you are probably right. But let me actually try and back it up a little bit. This is how I see the world. I think the technology and business world today is a little bit like a war. And it's hard to win a war if you actually don't know you are in it. And it's harder still if you don't understand all of the armies on the battlefield, what their strategies are, what they're actually trying to do, and therefore, how do you even compose your own winning strategy? And right now, you might be thinking, this guy is even more paranoid than I thought. And again, you are probably right. But let me actually try and explain a little bit of you, uh, try and explain a little bit of it to you and see if it makes sense. So the first army on the battlefield here is us, our company, your your company. In our case, we are Intercom. We are this small, naive, honest, hard-working startup. We have a business idea, and we are trying to execute it to the best of our ability and win our market. But just across the water, we have a, we have a growing number of copycats. And these are the people who see our business idea and are trying to beat us at our own game. And honestly, it has never been a better time to be a copycat. Why? Because some of the basic barriers to entry into markets are evaporating. Money is cheap, and basic execution is becoming easy. And let me actually back that up a little bit. Interest rates are at an all-time low. Investors are incentivized to put their money anywhere other than a bank. So if your business idea is in any way credible, or better yet, if your business idea is simply just to copy mine, and mine already has some social proof and success, there is a pretty good chance you are going to be able to get funding, money, and runway. And I said basic execution is becoming easy as well. If you think about it from about 2000 onwards, or whenever kind of cloud computing really started, you've had infrastructure as a service platform as a service, software as a service, serverless, and now we have the advancement of AI and ML, and in our lifetime, I believe there will be engineering as a service. Actually, I went back to college this year and started to study the fundamentals of user experience design, because I think in about 20 years' time, PMs and designers are going to rule the world. And the third army on the battlefield, then, is us. We are the soldiers, and there is a war for talent going on at the moment. Demand outstrips supply three to one. For every three product and engineering jobs which are posted, there is only uh, one person available to fill it. 
And nobody can win a battle if you don't have the right amount of soldiers. And the fourth army on the battlefield here are the most interesting, scary, uh, and successful ones of all. And, and this army is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. These are the four companies which compete on and in all of these different wars in super kind of interesting ways. And the first way they actually compete in the war for talent is they are trying to hire all of us. And they have some significant advantages because their companies are more stable, they have more money, they are able to pay more money, and they have better perks than most of us have. The second way they compete in this battle is a really interesting one. As I said, these are the companies who provided infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, soft, software as a service. And they are the ones who keep on raising this abstraction line higher and higher and higher. And on one hand, you can say, this is great. It enables me to build more and faster. It also enables all of your competitors to, to do the same. So they're actually taking a cut of every single battle, no matter who wins or loses. But the other thing they're doing is raising this abstraction line higher and higher. And if we all aren't careful and stay up to date with this abstraction line, we end up becoming commoditized and potentially deprecated. Engineering is a service, it's on its way. So right now, most of you again are probably thinking this guy is super paranoid, super, super paranoid. Maybe some of you are thinking, maybe I'm just about paranoid enough. Let's actually talk through some examples here. And I flicked this one up, if it'll come up. So this is one super interesting battle, uh, Slack versus HipChat. Hopefully, everybody here knows who Slack and HipChat are. HipChat were one of the first companies to, to come to market with modern team messaging and communication. Slack took note of it and started to do their own thing, and they started to really, really win this, this battle. And this is where they sit now, dominating the market and accelerating ahead. It used to be in the old days, first to market wins. Now it is first to do it best. Here's another battle between Instagram and Snapchat. Snapchat came along trying to revolutionize so, uh, social media, not only from a user perspective, but also from a marketing and revenue generation perspective. They were the first company to come up with stories as, a, as, as an advertising mechanism. Uh, Insta Instagram and Mark Zuckerberg took note of this and they started to copy it. And they started to copy it really, really, really well. And now we're at the stage where Snap is considered a dead stock walking, which is not super fun. I don't ever want to be a dead stock walking. The last example of this I'll give is for me the most scariest one and it's the saddest one. So if anybody here doesn't know Everybody knows Amazon. The other one is Blue Apron. Blue Apron are a meal kit company. They, they provide uh, recipes and ingredients to your door so that, so that you can cook a wonderful meal. Amazon uh, only silently registered a trademark indicating they might go into this business and, and Blue Apron stock started to tank. Amazon actually went into the business and started doing really well. And one month after Blue Apron's IPO, they had to announce 24% layoffs. Over 1,000 people lost their jobs. So this is like really scary and really sad. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of social proof here for some of my paranoia. So maybe people are with me a little bit now and thinking maybe some of this is worth, uh, maybe some of this is actually true, maybe a little bit. Time is short, opportunities are fleeting, money is cheap, basic execution is easy, talent is scarce, and the threat from one of the four is real. So, uh, hopefully people are with me so far. And you might be wondering, how do we win? And what the hell has it got to do with run less software? In the matrix, Neo is able to defeat a more powerful foe. And the way he does it is, he develops extreme self-awareness and he is able to 
see, understand, decide, and act more quickly than his more powerful competitor, thus enabling him to beat him. Now, I'm not Neo. This isn't the Matrix. I took the red pill before I came on stage, so, so I'm sure. But I admire his but I admire his general strategy. I think this being able to wield time business is something that's uh, worth looking into. And so for me, run less software is the mechanism by which we are able to save time and spend it wisely and thus have amazing execution capabilities forever and ever and ever. For us, that time saved can then be spent and our time well spent is when our precious soldiers, our, our precious people in our company spend their time doing only the most important and valuable and enduring differentiating things for our customers. And that's what Run Less Software is, and it has three pillars which I'm going to explain to you now shortly. The first pillar is about choosing standard technologies. The second is about saving more time by outsourcing on undifferentiated heavy lifting, and the third is by spending all of our save time creating enduring competitive advantage. So saving time by choosing standard te technologies. This isn't a new concept. F since forever, armies have always had a wide variety of tools and weapons at their disposal, but a, but a soldier never carries all of them into battle. They make a couple of opinionated choices and armies train with them religiously. Uh, for us, this is choosing standard technology or choosing boring technology. And what we do is we constrain ourselves to solving our problems with a small opinionated set of technologies. And by doing so over and over and over again, we simplify our decisions and we get really great at using those tools. If this sounds a little bit like Dan McKinley's choosing boring technologies from Etsy, it is very, very, very similar to it. We were inspired by this, and if anybody hasn't, resi if anybody hasn't seen his presentation, I absolutely encourage you to check it out. In it, he has this wonderful formula where he said, the engineering cost of any, uh, the cost of any engineering decision is equal to the sum total of all of the operational costs which arise from that decision minus all of the velocity benefits you actually get from that decision. And by choosing standard technologies, you get to have low cost engineering decisions which are cheap and easy to, uh, to maintain and quick and powerful to execute. This here eye chart is an example of it's, it's lessons learned, opinions made, and reinforced such that we have really, really strong stand, standard technologies. We only have two programming languages. We only have one way to do a relational database. We only have one way to do a key value store. All decisions get made super quick. Engineers get trained really, really well in these, in these technologies. But this is our list. It's perfectly acceptable for any other company to say, Go and Python are our programming languages, and Google Cloud Spanner is their, is their database. The point is not the technologies. The point is that you have made decisions and you stick to them. The astute among you may have noticed that a lot of our standard technologies are outsourced to AWS, which brings me nicely along to my second pillar, which is outsource undifferentiated heavy lifting. Peter Drucker, who was one of the best management consultants uh, so far, said back in the 60s, there is surely uh, nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency what should never have been done at all. Jeff, Jeff Bezos said many, 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 many years later, he felt that most businesses these days spend 70% of their time just, just doing overhead, running the business, keeping the wheel turning, and only 30% of their time focused on the stuff that really makes their business excel. Um, we're at the stage now, I count this stuff pretty regularly, I use a bunch of different measures, and I'm pretty happy to say that, that despite our business growing a lot and having to deal with a fair amount of overhead of staff scaling, more, more and more customers, more and more messages, we are still at the place where about 60% of our resources are spent building new things for customers. And we absolutely aren't happy there. We are gonna continue to try and move that number higher. 
The last pillar of Run Less Software is about uh, creating enduring competitive advantage. Tyler Durgan said, uh, the things that you own end up owning you. So let's have a look at the things we own and see how happy we are with them owning us. Well, the first thing we own in this list is a bunch of Ruby and JavaScript. And, we, and Ruby and JavaScript are the languages we build all of our uh, customer applications in. So I'm super happy with us uh, using and building and owning that. The bottom two, uh, Intercom Nexus and Intercom Messenger, are the back end and front end to the uh, Intercom messer Messenger, which all of those one billion plus end users interact with. I'm happy with us owning that as well. The middle one, though, bare metal Elasticsearch, I'm not so happy about it at all. Elasticsearch is just a search engine. We have looked high and low for somebody who will provide a great hosted Elasticsearch option. We haven't found one yet. If you know of one, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to keep waiting for AWS in order to make their one better and better. So that's all of the theory. Let's see how we've used it. The first one's super easy. About four years ago, we used to allow developers to pick between running MySQL and Postgres. And we made a, an opinionated decision. Everything is going to be on MySQL. Not only MySQL, it's going to be on RDS MySQL. And very shortly after that, RDS Aurora came along. Five times the throughput at 30% cheaper cost. This one actually worked out really, really well for us. The next one was scaling our user storage system. So for us, user storage is where we store all of those 1 billion plus end users. And we talk and interact with them a lot, so it is a really, really high throughput system. It was organically built in MongoDB, and after it started to have a load of problems, we applied run less software to it, rebuilt the thing on half on Aurora, half on DynamoDB, and we were able to get a 90% cost saving with a, with a near limitless scalability uh, at the other end of it. So super happy with this one. The next one, not so happy. Uh, Intercom's inbox is the thing all of our customers look at. You can think of it like Gmail for Intercom. We build it three times, once on web, once on iOS, once, once on Android. Sounds like run more software. We decided to see if we could rebuild the thing once using uh, responsive, res responsive web technologies. And honestly, the, the project never properly got off the ground. And the reason for this wasn't because the uh, engineering strategy actually was a bad one. The main problem was that it came top down. The, the decision to try and do this came from the leadership team rather than being super consultative and, and collaborative with the engineers. And this is like a reminder that, that I know I've used a bunch of warlike term, terminology here and there's a risk you all could think I'm like a programmer manager or something like that. I'm not, honestly. Uh, inclusivity and collaboration with everybody on the engineering and product function is absolutely essential for any engineering strategy to work. So I'm almost finished now. Uh, what's the prize? What do you get if you do all of this stuff uh, really, really, really well? And prizes are individual. They're uh, different for different companies, different people. Uh, so what you, what you all win, uh, what, what you all want to win is different. Uh, for me, I think we have one kind of common layer that everybody wants to do, which is kind of move fast and ship things. And I think this is what everybody needs to do if they want to win in modern product and technology businesses today. Why? Because shipping, shipping products, shipping new things out to customers is just life-giving in so many different ways. It's great for morale, it's great for momentum, it's great for your customers, it creates great feedback and learning opportunities, and all of these things together help you hire more and more people into your team, which is ultimately what, what you need if you, want to if you want to succeed at the biggest scale. And I think we're doing reasonably well at this. Uh, this, is a, this is a tweet from one of our principal engineers a couple of weeks ago. Right now, we're shipping code to production about 1,000 times a week. End-to-end, um, 
test times on our full, uh, full application stack are running at about three and a half minutes, and end-to-end -end deploy times out to about 3,000 EC2 instances are running at about 10 minutes. So this is like something our engineers love and are super, super proud of. Every single one of these changes is one step towards uh, unlocking customer value. And talking about that customer value, we think, uh, we think we're actually doing pretty well. In 2015, we shipped 150 customer-facing product improvements. In, in 2016, we shipped 50 facing product improvements, still almost, still almost one a week, and we had three huge projects. We managed to launch a whole new product. We, we completely revamped our messenger, and we did one huge feature onto uh, one of our other existing products. Last year, we got uh, 140 product improvement changes. And you might think, uh, it looks like you're slowing down a little bit as you go there. But if you think about it, uh, our company is growing hugely. We're having more and more engineers were coming in trying to uh, spe spend time uh, finding them, interviewing them, hiring them, training them. We have more and more customers. All of the amount of overhead which actually comes with a uh, fast-growing business is just so, so hard. And run less software really is one of these things which allows us to simplify and minimize all of the overhead you would normally assume happens when you scale. Uh, and for us, and for you, hopefully if you do all this stuff really well and find your own strategy for growing really, really quickly, you will get to be a really successful business. And as you do that, maybe more or less, Hopefully, you actually get to spend lots of time with the people you love. Thanks. Uh, I think I have a bit of time for questions. I kind of ran through that reasonably fast. Any questions out there? Yeah. So the question was, how did we manage to convince everybody to standardize on technologies, and how did we actually pick each of the, each of the standard technologies? And those are like two super interesting questions. And the first one happened about, four, uh, happened about four years after I joined, and this was where, or sorry, happened about four years ago, just after I joined. Uh, as a team, our organization was still really, really small at the time. All of us, all of us went off site for a day and talked about what was working and what wasn't working. All of us brought our unique opinions to the table and we just kind of talked about it and found what are the things which feel different, controversial, what are the things we kind of argue about. And some people were arguing about, we have so many different databases we should try and hire a bunch of DBAs. Other people were arguing, no, we don't want to have any DBAs. We just want to stick with uh, general purpose soft software engineers. And somewhere in the mix, our CTO, who was at the meeting, came out with this phrase, I just want to run less software. Uh, and that was, that was actually where the whole thing kind of crystallized from. It took a couple of days after that as we kind of, we kind of realized at the time, this is something we need to put a pin in and come back to. And so we did, and it kind of fleshed out and evolved over time. Um, how we pick the technologies is like a completely different and interesting thing. There's a way you can look at this and think, you don't need to know what's going on in the technology world. We have already picked our programming language, and we have already picked our, our, our database technology. But while that's true, it also isn't true. All of that standard technology list is a living, breathing, curated Google Doc owned by our CTO, and we are constantly looking at the technology world and make, making decisions about what's best and what isn't best. And right now we have new technologies like Lambda, which we consider candidate core technologies, and we're slowly but surely working on building up all of our operational tooling and training in order to make it easy for us to eventually bring those into our standard technology list. It's a great question, thanks. Uh, any other questions? 
No? Okay. Thanks very much.